looked at the idea that we wanted to kind of look at the first two phases of the in inductive method of Bible study, which starts with observation and then goes to interpretation. And the idea is that before you jump in and ask the question, what does this mean? We want you to take the and do the work of saying, okay, what's in this passage? Before you just jump to some study Bible, to some online resource tool, that you would have the skills to say, okay, what's going on in this passage? So we started you out looking at the idea of saying, so first start just within the text and look at just observing. So let's just kind of work together and do a little review since we haven't been together for a few weeks. What's the first thing you're going to do when you study this pa passage? Ask, ask four questions to basically understand what is the context, okay? So that's kind of the idea here, is we're going to ask four general questions to say what's going on in this passage from a contextual point of view, from that historical context. And those four questions are, who wants to shout one out? Who? who, okay. Now the who question is a big question because it's not just, one idea that we are talking who is the author, who's the recipients, and who are the main characters being discussed. And when we're looking at those three types of people, it's not just their names we want to know. Okay? We really want to know what's going on in their lives, what's their circumstances, what are their characteristics about their lives, why did the author write to that recipient, what was the relationship, and what kind of prompted them and motivated them to write beyond that. Okay, so um, some of you on your midterm, you only gave me author, recipient, main character, you didn't discuss it, so you probably didn't get as many points on that question as you wanted to, because we really want to know more about the author, recipients, and the main characters than, you know, like I said, all right? So what's the second and third question? A lot of times we put those two together. When and where? And this is more than just date and location. What else do we want to know about these two ideas? Cultural, yeah. What was going on in the religious practices at the time? What was going on in the political nature of that time? What was going on in, in some of the other dynamics, whether, you know, if you're looking at this story and Christ is telling a pair about farmers. So do we know anything about farming practices from this, this time period? All right, the last question is, what's the last question? What? Yes. Not why, but what. And the what is not meaning yet. What is the question trying to answer? Genre. Yeah. So when I were looking at the literary context, understanding that this book of the Bible was written in a particular type of, of fashion, and therefore it fits a certain type of genre. Just the same way some of you are writing back home to boyfriends and girlfriends, and that's a very poetic love letter. And if you wrote me that same type of letter, it might be kind of weird, right? <laughs> And so you know there's a genre that you write to your professor on an email, there's a genre you write to someone back home that you're trying to maintain a relationship with. Very different types of writings. And so same thing here. We want to know what the genre was. Okay, so this gives us the context. Well, what do we want to know next? What's the next step? Okay, so we're looking at three things to look to help us understand really the purpose. In other words, God gave us clues, understand what's important. All, these, all this information, God wrote this letter to us for a purpose to communicate some ideas. And so we really want to kind of, we want to know deeper things than, than just the context. And so we have some clues that help us understand purpose. So we call them three things to look for. And we look for things that are emphasized. Now that's the same idea of being what's important. So help to help us understand what's emphasized, there are three clues that God gave us. Say, this is kind of more important than other things. What are, those th what are some of those three clues? Large amount of space. Good. What else? Very good. Yeah, the order that something's written in. Last one is uh, sometimes God just comes straight out and says it. What's the stated purpose of this passage? Then... We see things that are repeated, like words, circumstances, characters from the Old Testament, New Testament, and pretty much any time you have the Old, the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament, it's pretty significant, all right? And then the last one, it's sometimes confusing to some of us because we're not English majors, and those are things that are related. So that, like the idea of literary terms, question and answers, cause and effect, these literary terms that help us understand how this passage was written. All right? 
Now, one more thing that we would do in this observation stage is what? We try to take a look at the flow of the passage through what? Yeah, we want to kind of summarize things. So we'd start with paragraph summaries, and then that would let us kind of move into more like big picture section summaries. And the idea is we want to get to a point at this stage, we want to come up with a summary with one summary sentence. In other words, by just our observational work, we're saying, look, I have an idea based on all this information about what's going on in this passage. However, if we're just looking at the text, we're not looking at anything else outside the text, we don't know everything there is to know, right? There's a lot of questions we have. And so when we think about the first steps of interpretation, what do we do? Now we're switching to the interpretation phase. What's the first thing we start back with doing? Ask the same questions. Yeah, because here's why. Sometimes we're not told who the author is. And so what we're really asking for is, what don't we know? What are the gaps in our information? Okay? So in other words, we want to identify what do we want to go out and find more information about. And once we do that, then we can check those resources, those commentaries, those study Bibles, those online tools, because that's kind of where we're going to find out that information. It's not in the text. It's even maybe in other passages. We're going to do some cross-referencing. And by doing all of that, now we're going to take this original summary idea, and we have more information. We have more clear information. We have more factual information that we can now come up to with a, a reasonable understanding of what the author's intent was. Right? In other words, the message, the meaning of the passage is not up to you. You should never say, this means to me. You didn't write it. It's not up to you to determine the meaning. The meaning is in the author. It's our job to understand it, to interpret the meaning. And so doing all this work, now we can come to the author's intent. Later on, we're going to start this talk in a little bit about you can now take it and start applying it to your life, but you never should say, this means to me. And to kind of help us make sure that we have the right idea about the author's intent, we want to confirm with an outline to make sure that we're not skipping anything. You know, we're not leaving out any information or skipping over a paragraph or a passage that just doesn't, we don't like. Okay? So this is what we've been working on so far. A lot of work, a lot of practice. You've done well. But the problem I think you get to is you kind of get to this point of just information overload. You ever feel that way, like you're doing a research paper, and you've been researching all these articles because your prof says, I want 10 sources, and, and so you got all, these, all this information, and then you kind of sit back and you try to make sense of it, and you're like, how does all of this come together? And you sit there and you rack your brain. I think that's really kind of one of the things that, that takes place here is sometimes when we read God's Word and we kind of work these different steps and we have all this information, we kind of get lost in the moment. And it's kind of one of those things where we're just basically saying, okay, what am I going to do with this? Where is this going to go? And the point where I want to kind of transition today is as we start thinking about what comes next, we start thinking, okay, what am I going to do about this? We kind of start getting ready to step into the application phase. There's a really important piece that I think and we in our Southern California or Western culture forget, and that we really need to push pause and really kind of meditate on Scripture. That so often as we look at our, 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 what is our devotionals, I mean, it's a thing that our youth pastors have told us for so long, like you need to be reading your Bible. And so, you know, we have, we have so much going on in our life. And so we kind of get in this mode of like, we read our Bible like it's another thing to do in the morning or in the evening, right? It's another checkbox, right? I wake up, this is my own personal routine. I wake up, I got to take a shower to wake up because I can't roll out of bed, take a shower, you know, shave, get ready, get dressed, go downstairs, read my Bible, get in my car, and it's like just boom, 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 and, and that reading your Bible becomes like this, all right, done, moving on. Or even worse, you got Bible homework, right? So now you're reading your Bible to do some homework assignment, and, and it's nothing more than homework, and it's kind of been disengaged from your soul, from your heart, and you kind of just sit there. Take your Bibles that you have, because I know you all have your Bibles. Joshua, chapter 1. Joshua. 
Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. God is kind of giving Joshua a, a pep talk, an encouragement. He's basically saying, all right, you're my man. You're going to do it. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. And in the midst of this, this pep talk about being a leader and being strong and being courageous, which he says over and over again, he says in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want to kind of build upon this idea of meditating, but I want you to see the benefits of this meditation. Um, I really think that in the midst of, of God saying, be strong, be the leader, be strong, don't be afraid, he recently says, meditate on God's word because he says, that's your strength for not being afraid. That's your strength for not being overwhelmed. That's how you're going to continue to maintain an understanding that I am with you. That when life gets hard and people reject you and people kind of turn their backs to you, that as you're reading the law and you're meditating on it, you're going to remember God has been doing all these things throughout our history. God is still with me today. And notice that what he says is, meditate on the word of God so you may be careful to do application, right? So in other words, meditation is that important link from our reading and understanding the passage of, or the meaning of the passage and doing. Without meditation, we don't get to the doing part. It becomes just something that goes in one ear and out the other, just like sometimes a professor's lecture. It's like, all right, I got the information, and it's only when someone says, this will be on the final, they're like, oh, mark that, biggie, underline that verse in my Bible, okay, that's on the final, right? But, you know, so much more, what God really has for us kind of walks away. So if meditation is really this most important element, right, that says you're going to be prosperous, I want to be prosperous, that you'll be successful. Man, I don't know what success is in God's eyes, but I want it, all right? Um, it's not necessarily numbers and wealth, so let's, not, let's get rid of that idea, but it was, let's get to this idea that it's this blessing of God. I want those things, so meditation becomes that key linchpin to go from one thing to the other, all right? So if we look at this, it's meditation. Now it's interesting, throughout the book of Psalms, and we'll talk more about this on Wednesday, we look at the genre of Psalms, there's a musical notation called selah that's kind of throughout different Psalms. What does that mean? Does anybody know what the word selah means? Pause, exactly. It's a musical notation. So as you're playing your piano and you're taking lessons as a kid, and you see that little rest kind of squiggly line that says take a rest, you take your hands off the keys, and you take a quick pause, and then you start playing again. That's exactly what that word Selah is doing, is saying, think about it. Think about it. Stop what you're doing. Stop singing. Stop moving. Stop reading. And just dwell on the thought I just said. So important. We'll see more about that on Wednesday. You know, the whole purpose of spiritual disciplines, I think, is to do exactly that. Push pause. The idea of fasting, the idea of solitude, the idea of silence go hand in hand with the, with the other disciplines of memorization and prayer and Bible study. Because in our society, we are so used to doing, right? We promote doing. We honor doing. We don't honor people that sit around and just pause. Think about it. You don't, you don't get rewarded for sitting around and being reflective. You don't really get rewarded for your contemplation. You get rewarded for what you produce. And so our society has elevated you to say, do more, right? I mean, I see it. I mean, I live in South Orange County where kids in like pre-kindergarten are already doing SAT test tutoring, right? It's like, all right, kid, you're going to be the all-star. You're going to do mommy and me everything. And you're going to be programmed 24-7. And it's like you're just go, 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 do, do, do. And I'm, it's, it, I, I'm even guilty with my own kids. You know, my, my son is a soccer phenom. And, I, and it's like six days a week he's doing something with soccer. And we're talking about even like what more could he do? And I'm like thinking to myself last night as we're coming home from the Galaxy Sounders game. I'm like, how much do I want to push my son? Is there time for him just to be still? And that's the whole purpose of spiritual disciplines. That's why I think it's so important that we think about the idea of meditation as part of our routine. Not just read your Bible, but meditate on it. Because that's what Joshua 1.8 says. That's the key. That's what's going to be helpful us to be careful to do everything that's written in it. 
So if that's so important, man, really what is meditation? And I think we really don't have an understanding of it, so I want to take the next few minutes and talk about this, um, because it really is the natural next step after your Bible study, all right? So first you understand what's in the past, and then you kind of take some time to think about it. Um, Richard Foster called it this. He called it sanctified imagination. I love that term, sanctified imagination. Uh, does anybody else in here love to daydream? Man, I just love to sit back in the back of the class because, you know, when I was a student, I always was like the back row student. You know, I never was in the spit zone right in front of the professor. I was always like back of the class, and I would just kind of be daydreaming the whole time. I love to do that. I think that's exactly really what um, meditation is all about. On your papers or in your computers, just kind of make two columns, right? In one column, I want you to put the word study, traditional study, okay? That's, that's like your left-hand column. And your right-hand column, I want you to put the word meditation. I want to talk about these two di- the, two, the difference between the two real quick. Because the first half of this class has all been about study, right? It's all about how you dissect the text, right? This is what s- traditional study is, dissecting the text. Four questions, three things to look for, paragraph summaries, right? We're just kind of working these steps. That's, that's study. Meditation is where you savor key word there. Savor the text. You enter into it. You know, we, I honestly believe, don't know what it means to savor something. You know, when we eat, it's like fast food, right? It's like, all right, let's run through to the drive through pick up something. We run to the calf. We even get a to-go to box the calf because we got things we got to get to. I never knew what it meant to savor something um, until I took my wife to uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, on our eighth anniversary. And you know, my wife and I love to travel. I've told you a lot about our travels in this class already. But for our eight year anniversary, I took her to New Orleans for 24 hours. Now we were living here in California, and at the time she loved watching this, the Food Channel Network. Let me watch that. It bothers me. I can't watch the Food Network because I just get hungry, and I just get really frustrated that I can't eat what they just made on the screen. And so, but she was watching this um, Food Channel Network, and she was really into Emeril Lagasse. Any of you guys who know who that Emeril is? He's the guy who goes bam all the time, right? And he's this really flamboyant uh, chef, and um, was really interesting. And so, um, she was fully watching his show every every time it was on. And so, I thought, being the really good husband that I am that I was going to take her to go to Emerald's restaurant in, in New Orleans for her eight-year anniversary. <clears throat> so six months in advance, I call up his restaurant, and I ask for a reservation. And it was a Saturday night. It was our anniversary. And they say, well, we only have um, an opening at 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, six months in advance, you got a 10 o'clock opening? And they say, well, you could sit at the diner at 9. And I'm like, the diner what do you mean and they say well we have this like this diner counter that you sit on a stool and it looks right into the kitchen and you could talk to the chefs and you could kind of talk with them but you're sitting on a diner stool at at the counter and I said okay so nine o'clock New Orleans time six o'clock California time my wife's really into this whole cooking thing right now so this might work out really well so I said sure put us down for nine o'clock at the counter so she didn't know anything about it. The day before we're supposed to leave, I just say, hey, for anniversary, pack your bag. I'm taking you away. I arranged for my parents to come down and watch our kids. And she's all excited. We fly to New Orleans, and we, we just have a great time. You know, we, don't, we, we get there in the early afternoon. Our, our, our residence is not until 9 o'clock at night, so we walk around the French Quarter, eat crawdads, have a good time, go back to the hotel, freshen up. 9 o'clock, we drive to the restaurant. We get to the restaurant. Now, I've already spent money on airline tickets, on a rental car, on hotel. So I'm thinking I'm I'm ready to do this restaurant right. So I budgeted in my mind, like, you know, like 40 bucks a plate. I'm thinking in my mind, you know, she's going to get something really nice. I'm going to get something really nice. We're going to have a great night. And this is going to be the capstone to this incredible 24 hours. And so, you know, I'm thinking in my mind about 100 bucks total for this meal, okay? I, I had gone prepared. And so on, we get there to the counter, and we sit at the counter, and sure enough, we get the menu, and a whole left side of the menu is just says, you know, like, duck orange and all these things that are 30 to $40. And I'm like, good, I have enough money to, to, to make this happen. The right side of the menu had one thing. All it said was chef's degustation. And it was an eight-course sampling of all of Emerald's latest creations. So I'm looking at the left side going, all right, what do I want over here? And I asked my wife, 
so um, what looks good to you, honey? And she says, I think I want to try this chef's degustation. And I'm like, oh, my word. And, and in my mind, I'm going, I can't say no to my wife on our anniversary date, right? That just kind of blows the whole theme of everything we have going on right now. And so, and I also know in my mind, I can't have like one little thing and for, you know, she's having eight little courses coming out, right? So it was going to be two chef's degustations. And, and so I know my budget is now completely blown. And so I'm thinking to myself, okay, um, thank God for a credit card at this moment of life. And, and I, and I kind of just, the waitress comes and she says, what would you like to drink? And I'm saying, we're gonna have water. And, um, and she goes, you want sparkling or still? I said, I don't understand. She goes, well, you buy your water here. You buy your bottle of water. And I'm like, oh, great. So, you know, we have the water and I, like I told you, I don't like the cooking channel. I don't like to cook, you know? That's the last thing I want to do after a busy day. And so, but all of a sudden, I knew I was going to be spending $350 on this meal. This meal became now the most important thing in my life. All right? So every little course that came out, I was asking questions about how this was prepared. Hey, tell me about you. Tell me about your life. I'm talking to the guys in the, in the, in the, in the kitchen. Tell me, where did you learn to cook? Is Emerald around? What's Emerald doing right now? We sat on those bar stools till after midnight. Three hours, man. I was milking that thing for as much as I was going to get out of it. What I was doing is I was savoring the moment, right? I was saying, I'm not going to let this go quickly and easily. I'm going to say, God, what is in this? How can I experience more of this? And that's what meditation is. Meditation is taking that mindset that I'm not in a rush. I push pause. I'm going to savor this moment. See, in, in study, we're asking questions about the text. But in meditation, we're letting the text ask us questions about ourselves and who are we and who is God. In traditional study, we read and compare facts and we think about, okay, kind of what does this mean? And, and yet in meditation, we just read to let God speak to us in light of the facts we've already read, right? We're not checking your brain at the door. We're not taking all this work and study and saying it's not important. What we're saying is, okay, God, I, I see some things you're doing here. I, I understand what you're trying to say. God, what does that mean for me? God, what big ideas are you trying to communicate to me about my life? See, if you know how to worry, and let me hear know how to worry. Let me hear stress about anything, whether it's finances, what are you going to do after graduation? You know, am I going to get married? All those kind of things that, you know, we kind of get consumed by. What grade did I get in Professor Keene's midterm? All those things that just keep you up at night, right? If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Right? Because what is worry? Worry is saying, if this happens, then this. And if that happens, then this, right? And we keep blowing up this idea that never is going to happen, right? Most of the things you worry about are not worth worrying about. Either they're beyond your control or they're stupid, right? But the idea of worry is we ask the question, what if? That's the same attitude and mentality. We say, okay, I want to make another scripture. And if God is this, then what if this could be? And if that could be, then, you know, so in other words, we start saying, God, speak to me, understand this. And honestly, I think the, the top priority is to, once you've done your study, to say, okay, God, I just want to listen now. I want to listen for you to speak through it. I want to quiet myself. It's interesting that the, the Quakers really had a lot to do and say about, about your, your body's position when you would meditate. You know, they would have this thing called, um, where they would do this, this palms up and palms down, where you would actually kind of just kind of picture yourself sitting there quietly, breathing slowly, and you would have your palms up, and it would, you would kind of just envision everything that was stressing you out and everything that was going on in your life, and then you would just kind of, kind of turn your palms down, and you would envision you just releasing all of those things. And then you turn your palms back up and say, okay, God, now you fill me with your thought. See, that's the real difference between Christian meditation and Eastern meditation. Eastern meditation, they're saying, empty your mind, right? Become one with the universe, empty your mind. Now, Christian, universe, Christian meditation is fill your mind with God's thoughts. Say, God, what do you have for me? And when you get God speaking to you through his truth and in his word, you meditate on that, you meditate on his word, and you think about it, and you roll it over again, over and over again, kind of like the way a cow chews cud, where he kind of just regurgitates it constantly, and it's 
you know, kind of gets the best out of it and kind of swallows it again and brings it back up and swallows it again. I know it's kind of gross in the morning, but think about it. That's kind of the idea that you're kind of saying, I want to go deeper in this. Now, just a couple of things I've found is um, lying down might work unless you're tired because then you're just going to fall asleep, right? And, and you might take, need to take a nap, but, I mean, that's not meditation. The other thing that I would encourage you not to do is to, like, sit with your legs crossed, your arms crossed, because eventually your body's going to get tired. It's going to distract you with pain and numbness. And so the idea is how do you not let other things stop the, 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 the connection with God? In other words, these things that sometimes, you know, become such great distractions, you need to kind of remove those. And so, honestly, for me, I have a chair. I've had this chair for the last 25 years. I mean, I've had this chair, you know, since my last part of college, and this chair becomes my place to do my time with God, because it's just my place where I go. My body knows that place, and it kind of just is able to expect, okay, God, you're going to be here. Now, the goal is to abide in Christ. The goal is not to hear some great message, okay? So if, you're, if you meditate on Scripture, and you come out of this time going, man, I really didn't really get anything new out of that, that's okay, because the goal isn't like, I'm now this great Bible wizard. The goal is, hey, I spent time with God. And sometimes when you're doing that abiding, it leads to something greater. Sometimes God does give you a great, great big picture. Sometimes God does give you comfort. Sometimes God does forge you forward in, in a ministry. Or sometimes God just confronts you with an issue and slams you and says, look what you're doing. There's a challenge. There's a test. Sometimes you just grieve over your own wickedness as you see yourself more from God's point of view. And sometimes there's nothing more than just silence, and that's okay. Because the reality is this, and we'll finish with this thought. It's when we meditate that we are more aware, and we will be careful to do, like it says, we may be careful to do everything written for us. All right? Meditation. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.